This is Emily Mazzarello reporting from UCC. We're going out to Davis on the streets to hear what people have to say about certain things that we're going to talk about in our Love Davis series. Today we're going out and asking the question, what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase, finding truth? Finding truth, kind of like what resonates inside of you, what's finding what's true for you. I think what truth is at 20 might be different at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Living from your heart and your spirit. Sudden realization. Growth, I think, and being uh, enlightened or learning something new. Um, I'm an engineering major, so that has very uh, scientific connotations for me, is uh, finding what can be explored and expressed empirically in line with evidence. Uh, well, I'm a scientist, so finding truth. Truth is a uh, something that you can test, and if it keeps coming up with the same answer, you can say, well, this is a theory. I kind of think of the Bible, which is kind of a cliche Christian answer, but at the same time, um, I think that it's the honest answer, and that finding truth is found in the Bible. I would say scriptures and probably dead people who have written smart things. <laughs> uh, before we get into the sermon, just want to encourage you uh, to call me if you uh, need to visit or sit and talk uh, or email me. Uh, there's a tradition that I have done always. Uh, the first sermon I preached at Gospel Mission in Sioux City, Iowa, I was so nervous I knelt down and prayed. And ever since I have knelt down and prayed. And that doesn't make me super spiritual, it's just the way I roll. So, here is uh, Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your Bible says uh, your word creates world, transforms people. And we open your word to hear you speak. Lord, empower me as I, as you speak to me. May I honor your word, and Lord, empower this congregation with your Holy Spirit, open their hearts and minds to receive your word, and be transformed. In Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love Davis. As you can see, I love Davis. <laughs> Why I love Davis? Because I love my city, Calvada. It's an university town. We have two major universities there. Calcutta University, Jadavpur University, and then we have this college, Presidency College. Calcutta University is located at a place called College Street. Before Amazon.com, uh, there were bookstores. And we have plenty of bookstores along College Street. Any book in the world, you can find there. And there's this coffee shop, among many coffee shops there, this is the historic coffee shop. It's called the Coffee House of Calvary. It used to be old British Parliament House, two-story, and people just sit there, drink coffee, drink tea, and talk about politics, literature, philosophy. Directors, actors, writers, poets, intellectuals, and just people like me would sit and talk about life in that coffee house. That's why I love Davis, because Davis reminds me so much of my city. You have coffee houses, you have this university, you have bookstores, restaurants, people mingling, talking about life, philosophy, literature. That's why I love Davis. But love also confronts we need to recognize the thing we love, or people we love, or the city we love, what's wrong, or what is off, and confront those issues, because love takes time to correct. And that's what the sermon series is all about. We are taking biblical cities and talking about how Davis resembles the biblical cities. Like the first Sunday, Pastor Doug talked about Jerusalem and Jerusalem's quest for righteousness. And how at times Jerusalem failed. And how Davis as a city resembles Jerusalem. 
The next Sunday, Pastor Matt talked about how we should not eat salary. And I'm okay with that. I love meat. I'm from Midwest. Sorry. No, Pastor Matt talked about how we should not strive for the crown made up of wilted salary, but we should look forward to that crown that God has in store for us. The crown that will not fade away. And today I'm going to talk about Athens and how Davis resembles Athens. And I invited Larry, he's got a deep, rich voice, to read the text for today from Acts 17, verses 16 to 34. In reverence for God's word, would you stand please as we read? <laughs> While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and his resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not very far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear more again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. You may see them. When I first visited Davis a few months ago for my interview, as I was waiting for Jen and uh, her group to meet with them, I was walking around because I heard from my wife who graduated from UC Davis that this is a cool town. And Paul was doing the same as he was waiting uh, for
for Timothy and Silas, he was walking around the town because he knew the city, Athens, had a stellar reputation. You have to know something about uh, Athens. Uh, Athens is called the cradle of democracy. Athens is where uh, philosophy was done. It was the center of philosophical discourse. Philosophers like Socrates and Plato were born there. Aristotle, Epicurus called Athens their home. And these philosophers were not just sitting around thinking about life or meaning of life. They were talking about stars, planets. They were talking about natural phenomena like eclipse. They were talking about cosmos, physics. Pythagoras coined the term philosophy. What that means is lover of wisdom. He used to say that only God who is divine is wise. I'm just a lover of wisdom. And Athens, in that culture, love for wisdom was very prominent. They loved pursuit of wisdom. But there was a darker side to it all. As you can see from verse 16, as Paul was waiting for them, he was greatly distressed. The Greek word translated distressed is the same Greek word used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to describe God's feelings towards idolatry. So what Paul was doing was participating in the same feeling by being distressed over all the idols that he was seeing. Everywhere he turned, there was a visual representation of a god or goddess. See, it was different in those times. They did not live in a country where we uh, say there's a separation of state and religion. Religion was a part of the social, social order. He could not participate in social life without participating in a religion. For example, you're a baker, you bake, and you have this cool shop downtown. You have to be a part of a guild of bakers. And you have to worship the god that bakers worship. God of dough, I don't know. <laughs> they had gods and goddesses for everything. They had gods for travelers, gods for uh, uh, bakers, gods for blacksmiths, gods for uh, gods protecting the hinges on your door. It's like Indian society. I grew up in a Hindu family and we have gods for everything. Can I confess something? I was not a great student. I skipped class. I did not study for my exam. Don't take me as your model. Because I see a lot of young people sitting here. Uh, but guess what? On the day of the result, when the exam result would come out, you would find me in the temple praying to the goddess of education. <laughs> so I was the opening the scripture and just reading to her and praying to her. Somehow, would you please change the scores? <laughs> so I don't have to face the wrath of my dad. Most of the time she didn't. <laughs> so there were goddesses and gods for everything in Athens, like in Hinduism. And sometimes these gods were created in human image. In the Bible, we talk about how humanity created in the image of God. These gods and goddesses were created in human image. If you know anything about the pantheon, Athenian pantheon, the supreme god, Zeus, Apollos, they had dysfunctional family. If you think you have a bad family, they have worse. Zeus' dad, Kronos, wanted to eat him. I don't have that kind of feeling toward my son, I can tell you that. See, what happened, Kronos dethroned his father and took over the throne and he became paranoid that my kids will do the same and he killed his sons and he tried to eat Zeus 
but could not, but Zeus would eventually dethrone Korans. Dysfunctional family. They are always fighting among each other, tricking each other, lusting after each other. Those were the gods and goddesses they worshipped, created in their own image. And they also worshipped heroes in that culture. Heroes who did great stuff in life. They fought great battles for that particular nation or country or for that locality. They worshipped those heroes. And they believe when these heroes died, they became immortal spirits. So in that time and culture, how was gospel received? How was the good news of Jesus that Paul was preaching, the resurrection that he was preaching, how was it received? Not very well. You see, the next verse, 17 through 18, uh, as he was reasoning, uh, in synagogues, and as he went to the mall, the marketplace to preach, Paul liked to preach, he was a good Baptist preacher, uh, he went and preached, and a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Epicureans did not believe in physical resurrection, they believed that after death the body disintegrated. They were more like the deists. They believe that God is distant, far away. God is not personal. God has nothing to do with what happens on earth. And their highest virtue was pleasure, seeking pleasure, minimizing pain. And Stoics also did not believe in resurrection. They believed in some form of existence after death, but not personal individual existence. They believe that autonomy, self-reliance is the virtue. That rationality took priority over emotional life. And these people did not understand this gospel that, was, that Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about a personal God. One God. And this God is so different from gods like Zeus. He was not fighting over thrones with other gods. He's a loving, self-giving God who according to Philippians 2, verses 6 to 11, revealed himself to Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was one with God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. He did not grab onto the throne and he didn't say, I'm not going down to the earth. But he made himself nothing, became a human being, a slave, and died on the cross. What a different God this is. They had no notion of a God like that. And then, this Paul is talking about this Jesus, a Galilean Jew, and worshiping him. He was not like the heroes they worshiped. He didn't fight battles, but like a lamb. He went silently to the death, and he, death, and he died under Roman rule, suffering the worst possible punishment, death by crucifixion. To them, it seems like foolishness. To them, it seems like Paul was babbling about something he didn't know. And that's why he, they say to him, what is this babbler trying to say? The Greek word translated babbler literally means birds that pick up seeds. But they were saying that Paul picks up knowledge here and there. He really doesn't know what he's talking about. He's silly, stupid, doesn't know, doesn't have a clue what the truth is. So how does this atmosphere relate to Davis? Davis is a cool university town like Athens. By the way, by the time Athens came under Roman rule, it lost some of its prominence. But it was still the prime university town of the empire. People sent their kids to Athens to study under the best. Did you know Davis is the second most educated place in this country? If you do research according to QS that does that studies universities all across the globe. According to them, 
University of Davis ranks 95th in the world. Compared to University of Davis, Emory ranks 156. Medical uh, Science of UC Davis ranks 56. Natural Science 46th in the world. It's a really educated and a great town, great university. And no wonder people from all over the world come leading to this tremendous diversity that we have here. Cultural, social, political, religious, ethnic, racial diversity. It's a great place. Did you know Davis could be one of the few places where you have more Thai restaurants than McDonald's? <laughs> Seriously. And it's a good thing. Because I like my hot banana curry. This is where you have Korean and Mexican fusion. Parent took me by one of those restaurants. This is where you can find Indian tacos. <laughs> Jen, who was in the search committee, asked me if I knew Bollywood dancing because she was learning Bollywood dancing from a Latino guy. What a great place. <laughs> And I told her I would do liturgical Bollywood dancing on a Sunday. That's it. <laughs> it's a cool place. You have religious diversity. You have Indian Cultural Association that celebrates Hindu calendar. You have Islamic Center. You have Buddhist Meditation Center. And not too far away in West Sac. You have the Sikh temple leading to the tremendous religious diversity of this place. But there's also a lot of idolatry growing on, going on in this place that would distress Paul. And that should distress us as well. Idols that we worship, idols of self, for example. According to one individual on, the, on that video, Truth is, what I decide as true. It depends upon the self to decide what is true, leading to this whole notion of relativism, that there's no universal truth. Truth is what a person decides to be true. It could be true for you. It could be not true for another person. But that's not how we live in our everyday life. Otherwise, we would not have jail cells. Because we choose universally to agree that certain acts are wrong in itself. The second form of idolatry that we see in this area is the idolatry of intellect, science. As one person said, the truth is for me what I can experiment in lab over and over again and come up with the same result. By the way, science itself is not bad. We all use science. I love science. Saint Anselm, he is a philosopher and, and a Benedictine monk. He used to say, he used to use the, this was his motto, faith seeking understanding. What that meant is that our love for God should lead us to seek deeper truth about God. We need to seek deeper truth about God because we love God. And a way to seek deeper truth about God is to seek it through science. But it becomes an idol of worship. If, like the Stoics, in the Athenian culture, we start to worship rationality over everything else. We start to say, truth is for me what I can test in a lab and come up with the same result. Guess what happens? God will not put himself in a lab for you to test him. That leads to rejection of God. Guess what happens? Then you discard all forms of supernaturalism like resurrection which cannot be repeated. The third form of idolatry in the society is that of pluralism. It is very cool to say by the way, in the Athenian culture, one of the virtues that they upheld is this belief 
that no single religion is the truth, that all religions are equal, and they encourage people to worship all religions and treat them as equal. And sometimes that's what we do. About 75% Americans in this country right now believe that all religions are equal. No one religion can hold on to the ultimate truth. Oprah Winfrey well expressed the sentiment when she said, the mistake we make is to think that one religion has the truth. All religions lead to the same God. My humble question to Oprah, which God does all religions lead to? Because Buddhists believe in nirvana as the ultimate reality. Nirvana means to extinguish. What is the ultimate goal of human life? Is to extinguish all your desires, all your emotions, feelings, and become one with the universe. It's an impersonal Godhead as opposed to the personal creator God that we believe in Christianity. So my humble question to the pluralist is what God all religions lead to. We have a Denmark in Wisconsin and we have Denmark in Europe. Unless you decide which Denmark you're going to, I cannot tell you how to go. <laughs> and that's the problem. See, religious pluralism doesn't do justice to any religion. It's cool, but it's not practical. And many educated people in Davis believe in religious pluralism. So how do these intellectuals of Davis treat Christianity? People who profess that truth can only be personal, they treat the ultimate truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life as act. You Christians are arrogant. And scientific people, not all. I met many scientific people in this church, great men of God, I love them. But some treat Christianity as a fairy tale because it cannot be experimented in their own land. And religious pluralism simply treats Christians as narrow-minded and bigoted. Basically, they all call Christians Babylon, people who know little to nothing. So what do we do? Have you heard of Angelette, comedian, magician? Anyone? Yeah. He once said, he was, he's not a Christian, but he said, how much do you have to hate someone that when you know eternal life is possible, that you do not say that to that person. The most loving thing we can do is what Paul did. Speak the gospel in love and truth to others. Love speaks. Paul then stood up in the meeting of Arab Davis where the council met that regulated the city life, that regulated a philosophical discourse, education, that oversaw the whole judicial system. He was speaking in front of very educated people and he did not recoil in fear, but he spoke the truth. Yes, we need to live out the gospel. We need justice and pursuing mercy, but at times we also need to speak. Jesus did both. He went around feeding people, healing people, exemplifying the gospel to others, but at the same time, he did not hesitate to say, repent, for the kingdom of God is here. Love must speak, but we must learn to speak the truth in love, and that's what Paul did. He spoke the truth in love. He affirmed what was good about the Athenian culture. See, God has left nuggets of truth in every culture that we need to find and use to point people to God. He not only used the altar to the unknown God, but he also used their poets. He affirmed and also entered into their culture for in him, he said, we live and move and have our being. 
as some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Most likely he was using poets like Epimenides to talk about uh, the gospel. He was using what he found in their culture. He was conversant with their culture. He spoke their language he, because he took time to enter their world. See, when I go to India, I speak the gospel to people by using what we have in our own culture. If you go to India, you have temples where they still, still sacrifice animals for the atonement of sin. You go to a temple, you will see these lambs and goats, and they lay their hands on those lambs and goats, and then they slaughter them for the atonement of sin. And I use that to tell people about Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Love speaks. Love affirms what is good in a particular culture. Love takes time to enter into the culture. Embrace the culture. And lastly, love confronts. Sometimes the problem is we are good at entering, good at performing, but we are too fearful to speak. Because we do not want to offend. I will admit I have the same tendency. It's hard to confront the lie with the truth of God, and that's what Paul does. He affirms, but he also says, so you are ignorant of the very thing. That unknown God you are worshipping, but you don't know that God. And he introduced them to the truth of God. He speaks about the God who created everything, who is so unlike their idols. He said this God does not need a temple to live in because guess what? He created the world for you to live in. He says, this God does not need you to cater to his needs because he is the one who gave you bread, gave you life, and will give you everything you need. And he confronts them with the repentance that they need, that they need to turn away from these false gods and turn to one true God, through Jesus Christ. He confronts them with this whole unpopular notion which we don't like, the prospect of judgment. And he said one day God will judge everyone with righteousness. And he confronts them with the truth of Christ. That God had made this one man the Lord and the judge of the universe and he proved it by raising him from the dead. He preaches the gospel to these people who were living far away from God. And that is the most loving thing that we could do for David. is not only to act out the gospel, pursue justice and mercy, but also to speak it to the people here. There's a great poem that I like, and I'll read it to you. It talks about the futility of life. Futility of our arrogance, how everything comes to nothing. It's called Asmendeus by Shelley. And here it goes. I met a traveler from an antic land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sun, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survives stamped on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, he mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. What a tragic end to pride, to arrogance. Ozymandias one day screamed on the king, look at me, all the things that I have made, but time came wiped everything away. 
What do you think would happen to Davis years and years and years from now? Here is a picture of ancient ruins of Athens. Many of the sacred institutions in Davis will one day resemble the ancient ruins. Nothing will remain. We can scream, God, look at my PhD. God, look at the scientific discoveries I made. God, look at my intellect. But one day, nothing will remain. The only thing that will matter that day is how the people respond to the truth of God, to the gospel. Therefore, the greatest thing, the most loving thing that we could do for Davis is speak the truth of Jesus Christ in love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you. For you are our great God. You love us so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for our sins. And you have called us to preach that good news to others. Give us courage. Give us strength to do this thing in this community and in this world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.